the truth will make you free. Um, we were in a series called The Truth Will Make You Free, and three weeks ago I introduced the third theme or the third module of this series. I call it The Believer's Resources, and so far we've looked at three resources. The first resource is the believer's position in Christ, because when we truly understand our position in Christ and embrace it, it will transform us until we can increasingly experience all of the benefits and all of the realities of being in Christ. There are uh, uh, um, notes, uh, sermon notes uh, there um, uh, in the foyer. Okay. Uh, number two, the believer's faith. We looked at the believer's faith, and we had to look at that. It's one of our resources, but it's by faith that we, we must use faith in order to receive all of the resources of Christ. It's everything we receive in the kingdom is by faith, including the fullness of our position in Christ, okay? The third resource we have is the believer's authority. We looked at that last time because when we, uh, um, when we are in Christ, we have, remember what I said, we both have the authority of Christ and the power of Christ in order to overcome every work of the devil. And that's, we're going to talk more about that today. And today, I want to talk about exercising our authority, okay? I want to talk more about our authority in Christ and then understand how to exercise the authority that we have, okay? So first, we look at the source of our authority and power. Yeah, okay. Um, Last time we discovered that the authority, that authority, what is the definition of authority? Authority, I should take that back, so you're reading that. <laughs> the, the definition of authority is the right to rule, okay? The definition of authority is the right to rule, and power is the ability to rule, right? You, ha you can have the right but no power, and you still can't rule. You have to have the authority or the right to rule. Someone's got to give you that right to rule. But you also need power behind you. And we discovered that Jesus has given both power and authority to his disciples, to those who are in Christ, okay? And now we'll look at those verses. Luke chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. When Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out demons and to cure all uh, diseases, and he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick, okay? So he gave them authority, and after they had used their authority a bit, they came back and said, wow, well, even the demons submit to us. And Jesus said, let me clarify to you the extent of your authority. How much authority do you, th do you have? How much authority do you think you have? Let me tell you how much authority you have. Luke chapter 10, verse 19, I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions, those are demonic powers, and to overcome some of the power of the enemy. So, excuse me? <laughs> all, oh, all. All of the power. Come on, really? Do you really believe that? All? Yeah. See, do, do you understand this? All. All, whatever Satan can throw at you, you have authority over it. No matter what it is, no matter how it comes, you have authority over that. Over all the power of the enemy. And so as Christians, we have Christ's delegated authority to do his will. And we also have his power activated in us as long as we abide in him and, and sit in our position in Christ. Because it's from our position in Christ, seated in him at the right hand of God, that we're able to release that authority. If you get out of that position, if you start doing your own thing, operate in the flesh, then, then you lose the ability to function in the authority of God. And that's why, it's, well, we'll talk more about that later. But anyway, so we have that power and authority as long as we abide in Christ. But if we react in fear, fear okay, or we try to take out the devil in the flesh, we're going to lose, even though we have power and authority. Why? Because if fear is controlling our life, then faith is not. Okay? We operate by faith. Everything we, we, we do and receive and function in is by faith, not by fear. And fear will keep us from using our authority and power in Christ. I know this, man. I was first a Christian, and I knew nothing of power and authority. And I had a, you know, I, I was foolish enough to say, Lord, would you please reveal to me the reality of the demonic realm? Stupid prayer. Really. For a, for a really young Christian. The very next night, 
this girl manifested a demon. It threw her back and forth across the room. She was screaming and shrieking. It was scary stuff. And, and I'm going, I know what to do. I, you know, I just, I'm as scared as the lady that's being attacked. And, and so I'm, I, I'm trying everything I can possibly do. I'm, you know, like, oh, you know, there must be a prayer. Like, you know, it's like I just become a Christian. I'm, oh, God, what prayer can I pray? Like, like oh, dear Jesus, dear, dear, dear Jesus. You know, dear Jesus' prayers really don't do anything. I'm sorry to say that. It's like the beginning of a letter. Dear Jesus. It really does nothing. Um, so I'm going, dear Jesus, please help me. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. You know, Jesus, now I understand theologically, Jesus said, well, I already died on the cross. I've already done it all. What are you asking for now? You know, do something for me now. No, what Jesus already did on the cross. And he gave me authority. And I'm asking God, please show your authority. And God said, no, I gave you authority. So in, in a moment of, of, uh, of absolute panic, and not even having a clue what I, I was doing, I said, stop it, Satan. And the demon stopped. I went, how did that happen? Like, how did, like, see, as long as I was operating in fear, I had no authority. But as soon as I used my authority, even though I didn't really understand what I was doing, then the, the demon stopped. And as I told you last week, the end of the story was then she was attacked again. I went back into my, oh, dear Jesus, please do something routine. But then a man of God walked through the door. We called him. He walked through the door, and he already knew he had authority and power. The demons already knew he was, had authority and power. And as soon as he walked through that door, the demon left. It didn't even wait for him to say anything. As soon as he walked in the door, they knew it was coming, and they left. And then he was able to minister to the girl. Anyway, all that to say, if we're functioning out of fear, we're not able to function in our power and authority. You know, a police officer has the authority, the right to stop a person, right? They have that authority. And they also have the ability, the power to stop the person because they have the full backing of either the civic or the uh, provincial or the federal government, depending on their, their, what type of officer they are. But if they don't know they have authority or if they don't know they have power or if they're struggling with fear, like, uh, you know, if I, if I tell the car to stop, what if they don't stop? Like, you know, I, I'll feel rejected maybe. I'll be, you know, like, what's going to happen? Like, maybe they'll run into me. Like, they're not going to do anything, right? It's all, so you can't function in your power and authority if you're afraid. You have to function out of faith, okay? Um, okay, where are we going here? So, uh, actually, I'll do this then. We, we need a revelation of our authority, okay? We need a revelation of our authority. The Apostle Paul, he was so wanting for us to understand or be confident in our power and authority that he even prayed for us. Okay, Paul prayed for us. Here's what he prayed. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 to 20. The, pray that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, okay? That illumination would come to your understanding, that you would know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of an inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us, to you and I who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which we worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavy places. So Paul prayed, I, I'm praying that your understanding would have illumination, that it would be enlightened, that you would have a revelation, not beyond a, a knowledge, beyond an information, that you would have a revelation of the incredible great power that Christ has given you. Okay, and understand that that when it you allow it to work in you, right, according to the, uh, the working of his mighty power, when you allow that power, when by faith you release that power and you allow it to work in you by faith, how powerful is not it? Well, it's the same power that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly places. So what Paul was saying, that when we take our delegated power authority and power it is actually the same power that caused jesus to come back to life it is resurrection power it's just not you know a little bit of power right it's not like 10 volts or whatever you know or whatever 25 watts or what joe's new 40 watt amp there it's not just 40 watts right this, this is like talking about resurrection power and ascension power. It raised him from the dead and raised him up into the heavenly places. Now that is power, right? And Jesus said, I need you, or Paul said, I want you to have a, a revelation that that's the power that's available in you. That's what it says. Okay. All of that 
power, resurrection, ascension power is given to us, but it's only exercised by faith. And, and, and you know, and some people say, well, you know, how come, you know, I can only do this and you can do that. And, you know, my son-in-law, Sammy, can do this, right? He's had two resurrections from the dead this last year. Okay. Pretty impressive. <laughs> it's like, we've only had one and she was only dead for three minutes. But it still counts, I think, right? It still counts. I think it counts. Okay. But, you know, he had one that was dead for 15 minutes. And, and but what's the difference? Because it's, he expects his level of faith, another word for faith is what? Expectation that God will actually do what he promised to do, and he'll do it from, for, through you. See, it's one thing to believe that God can do it. It's another thing to believe that God can do it through you. And Sammy just knows, yeah, God can do it through me. And so he sees massive amounts. He's in South Korea right now as we speak. A and he's seen miracle after miracle after miracle. Not because he's, oh, he's so much, you know, like Sammy. You know, it's not because he's so much higher than anybody in this room, but because he's a greater degree of expectation and, and revelation that God can do, you release that power through him. That's the only difference. That's why Paul said, I pray that your, 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 your head, you know, your, your thinking, your understanding, your processing would have a revelation would have an illumination of the power, which is not any, no, that's in my notes, but anyway. Okay, so, um, so but w you know, now, now as Christians, we can be confused, and actually many Christians are confused because they seem to think, or they seem to say, well, you know, like the Bible seems to say that Satan has power and authority too. Like, is it Jesus has it, or is it Satan that has it, or is it us that has it? I don't understand. Well, we know that mankind originally had authority and power in the garden. God gave all that to, to Adam and Eve, but they forfeited their authority when they sinned, right? And the moment they sinned and they submitted to Satan, they also released their authority and power into Satan's hands. By sinning, whenever we sin, we're submitting our authority and power to Satan. That's something to think about. Every time we choose to sin, we're submitting the authority and power that Jesus has given us into the hands of Satan. Now, we know that uh, the devil, therefore, became the rebel holder of authority uh, um, and even functioned in the role of a god ever since that time. Look, at, look we're just going to go through this quickly. Uh, Satan stole humanity's authority, and now he is called... The God of this age, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this age has blinded, the blinds of, has blinded the minds of unbelievers. One of the things the God of this age, age, Satan does, is blinds unbelievers' minds. They cannot understand or perceive the truth of the gospel. So if we're going to minister to the lost, we have to pray first and bind uh, Satan, who is blinding their minds. Another thing Satan is called is the ruler of this world. John 14.30, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. The ruler of this world is coming, okay? He's called the ruler of this world. He's also called, John uh, 12, 31, the prince of this world, okay? The prince of this world will one day can be completely driven out. Number four, he is called the ruler of the kingdom of the air, okay? Ephesians 2, verse 2. We used to follow, before we became Christians, we used to follow the ways of the world, and the ways of the ruler of the kingdom of this era. Now note, he's also called the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, okay? That's another one of his titles, but I'm talking about his authority, and, and I will try to remember that point for later. He's also called the authority over all the world's kingdoms. Satan said to Jesus himself in Luke chapter 4, verse 6, it has been given to me, Satan said, all the world's authority and splendor. He has authority over all the world's kingdoms, and, if, and he's also called the controller of the whole world. First John 5, 19, it says the whole world is under the control of the evil one, okay? He's the controller of the whole world, and I think I have uh, one more here. Um, he's the leader of a demonic hierarchy, too. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, the, there are rulers, there are authorities, powers of this dark world, a or spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Okay, those are all under his rule. So he really is called the ruler of this world, the prince of this world. Now, and sadly, um, Satan, the devil, is still all of these things. D don't, don't, don't be tricked here. He's still all of those things, He's over, he's, he is still all those things uh, to, to those who are in the world. Good news, we're no longer of this world. 
<laughs> so he's not over us anymore. But if uh, the unbelievers are still being blinded, My, their minds are still being blinded. He's still controlling them. And as we read this last uh, verse here, um, he is now in work in those who are disobedient. That's a big thing. You ever, you ever like look out your door recently and see all the disobedience in the world? See all the stuff that's going on, the crazy stuff? It's because the spirit, Satan, the ruler of the area, the spirit is at work in those who are disobedient. So you can't just like get a big placard and go out and, and protest against all the disobedience. You have to take authority over the spirit of those who are disobedient. And unfortunately, sometimes Satan tries to work in our children, in our uh, uh, neighbors, in our uh, um, relatives, our family, and other things. And, and, and if you don't take authority over the spirit, all you're going to do is get into an argument with the other person. We have to take authority over the spirit. See, because we have no, uh, I'm getting off track here, but we have no authority over human beings. You know that? We have no spiritual authority over human beings. I'll explain that more in a minute. Uh, but sometimes human beings are being used by demonic forces, and we do have authority over them. So we don't take authority over the person, take authority over the spirit, and, finally find, and then suddenly find the, peer, the person is more uh, open to what we have to say. Anyway, we'll get into that. So uh, Jesus took back his authority, and he gave it to us through his death right on the cross, his, his resurrection from the dead. Jesus took back his authority. Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. He has, he has taken it out of the way. Okay, all those old rules. Okay, the law. He took it out of the way. He nailed it to the cross. And then 15, having disarmed principalities and powers. Who are those? They're the ones we talked about, those demonic forces. He disarmed them. They are disarmed over us. They have no right or authority over us anymore. Okay. And then Jesus gave us his authority, right? He, he gave his authority to his followers, and, and if you're a Christian, then hopefully, hopefully you understand you're a follower of Christ also. You're a disciple of Christ. And, and so the devil is no longer our ruler. He is no longer our prince. Uh, and now Jesus is our new ruler and our prince. And he wants us to administrate his authority and power in the world today. Okay? So back there when that demon first uh, uh, appeared many years ago when I was first a Christian... You know, here I am asking God to do something, and, and, and God's saying, well, you do something. You have the authority. You have the power. You're my representative on the world today. Jesus is the head. You're the body. You're the, you know, the body has the hands and feet. Do you understand that? Okay, he's the head. He, he gives the commands, but we're his hands and feet. And if we don't do something, it doesn't get done. And we can beg him all we want. And say, dear Jesus, please do something. He's going, well, I went to the cross. I died. I was buried. I was resurrected again. What else do you want me to do? I sent his, my Holy Spirit. I gave you power and authority. What do you want me to do? <laughs> and, and we need to get that. He's given us. If we don't do it, it doesn't get done. Because he's given us power and authority. Um, there. Matthew chapter 28, 18. Jesus came to them and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me now, right, through his death and burial and resurrection. Therefore, you go. I will send you with delegate authority and you can be my res representatives. Now, we have to remember, as I said before, that our authority is connected to our position in Christ, okay? Um, you know, the apostle Paul, he, he encouraged us. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord. That's your position in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. That's the power, okay? In his position, you have the right and the power. You have the authority in the power, okay? And in his mighty power. So we have to be strong in the Lord in our position in Christ. Not weak in our position. Strong in our position in Christ. And then we can be strong in his mighty power, Okay. However, if we do not know our position in Christ, or if we are not living in our position in Christ and by our position in Christ, we will not be able to properly exercise the power and the authority that's been given to us. Now, remember that the right hand of God is the place of God's power and authority. You understand that. The right hand of God is the place of God's power and authority. It's, a place, it's actually the center of God's power and authority, and it's, it's the place where, the, where the, the throne is exercised 
uh, uh, it's been given to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's sitting there on the throne at the right hand of God, and, and at the right hand of God, as I said, is also power and authority. But then Jesus seated us with him. Okay, Ephesians chapter two, verse six, God raised us up with Christ in the, our spiritual in our spirit. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. Why do we need to understand that? Because we can't exercise his power and authority if all we were were seated on the earth. So he had to seat us up with him in heaven at the right hand of God, where there is the power and authority of God. And from our position in Christ again, at the right hand of God, we can release authority. We can release power. I used to pray, oh dear Jesus, I know I have, I have all these things in heavenly places. If he, what, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, God has given me all, all these blessings in heavenly realms. I need to learn how to pull them down to earth. But now I, I go, no, that's not true. I am seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. I'm seated right there at the right hand of God in the seat of power and authority. I, from that position in my spirit, I release power and authority down to the earth from that place, right? I don't pull it down. I, I send it down because I'm seated with Christ in the heavenly realms, okay? We share that authority. But we only can administrate that authority when we recognize we are seated. We, we, are, we recognize our position in Christ. We're seated with Christ, okay? Now, another thing we have to understand is that our authority is not independent of Christ, and it's, not, it's also not absolute. What I mean by that? Well, number one, uh, well, I'm sure you've all heard about the seven sons of Sceva, right? Seven sons of Sceva, Acts chapter 19, verses 13 to 16. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish uh, chief priest, so they had position, right? <laughs> they had uh, uh, right, but they didn't have any power. <laughs> uh, in, in the name of the Lord Jesus, whom Paul preached, I command you to come out. The seven sons of Sceva, Jewish chief priests, were doing this. One day, the evil spirit answered them. Jesus, I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Isn't that, it's like, who are you? I don't know you. I don't know you, because you don't know Jesus. Then, then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house. Can I say that word in, in church? Naked and bleeding. They tried to use Christ's authority and power, but that spiritual authority and power is only for those who are children of God, those who are in Christ. And those who are walking according to their revelation of being in Christ. I hope you're getting this. You need that revelation. I need that revelation. I am in Christ, in my position in Christ. That's where the power and authority are. And also, I just need to add that our spiritual authority is not over each other. I already talked about this. Um, you know, it's, it says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20, submit to one another. It doesn't say everybody submit to the, the guy over you. It said we have to submit to one another. Why? Because we have no absolute authority over people. I can't use my authority. I can't use my authority in Christ over another person. Say, you have to be nice to me now. In Jesus' name, you have to be nice to me. It it will not work. Why? Because I have no spiritual authority over another person that was created in God's image. Okay. Remember back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God said, I'm going to give you authority to rule over all the creatures, but not over other people, right? It was never God's intention that we would ever rule over each other. He, he only, it was God's intention that only he rule over humans, okay? And when the Israelites, they begged God for a king, he said, like, don't ask that. You don't understand you, how foolish that question is. Because no human can be completely impartial and, 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 and rule in love and justice over other people. No human can do that. We're just not, not able to. And so he said, please don't ask for a king. And they said, we want a king anyway. As a matter of fact, we'll choose Saul. He's a nice, tall, proud, arrogant, insecure man. Let's choose him. Um, and then <laughs> goes downhill from there, okay? 
See, because men were never meant to rule over men. That's why the kingdom principle is there are governmental positions, but at the end of the day, we have to submit to one another. Okay? And eldership is a plurality of eldership because we have to submit to one another, hear one another, correct one another. Okay? We're not ever to rule. I cannot rule. I can, I can, by the Spirit, encourage you to follow the ways of God, but I can't command you a rule. That is manipulation. That is control. That is of the devil, and don't ever accept that. Okay? So every true believer has both authority and power to do God's will, must, but we must function in faith according to his authority and his power in order to do God's will. And, you know, we, and we only have authority to do God's will, not our will. Right? Nothing more, nothing less. We only have authority and power to do God's will because it's delegated authority from him. Okay, we're almost we're moving towards the end. I want to talk about uh, um, their qualifications for functioning in authority, okay, uh, or how to function in authority. Well, number one, I've already talked about it. I just really want to reemphasize this point. There it is. We have to believe we have to have faith in our authority and power. Ephesians chapter 1, 70, 19. We already talked about this. Let's talk about it a bit more. Paul prayed. I keep asking. Ephesians 1, 70, 19. I keep asking. I keep asking. I keep asking. I keep asking. He really knew how serious this was. Man, if you can understand your position in Christ, it will revolutionize your life and, and put you on a whole new level of Christian living. And so Paul said, hey, guys, I keep asking. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, okay, that, so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened, illuminated, in order that you would know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Okay? Now, um, so we need wisdom and revelation. So number one, why? To know God better, right? So that we would know God better, know him better. Because if it's only when we truly know God that we can function according to his will and according to his ways. Remember the Old Testament, said, it said the Israelites, they, they saw God's works, but they didn't understand his ways. And they got off track because they didn't understand his ways, his heart, how he functioned. All they saw was his raw power, but they didn't notice his compassion, his grace, his, his mercy. And, and, and so Paul says, I, I want you to know him better so that as you use your authority, you don't get off on some weird tangents and start to try to abuse people or manipulate people. Okay, I pray that you would know God better, that you would function according to his will and his ways, and that you would properly, therefore, represent his character and his, uh, 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 his heart on the earth. What's the number one, you know, again, I, I don't want to go off on a, on a, a beat-up Christian's uh, sidetrack here, but I really believe that in our attempts to try to get passionate about the, the things of God, we have misrepresented him so much in North America that that's what's turned off most people. You know, that's really what's turned off most people. Not, not, the, not the incredible news about the love of God, but the way we demonstrate him with, with judgment, with criticism, with, you know, the names we use, uh, uh, the way we live our lives. And, and so Paul says, yeah, I keep asking, I keep asking that you would know him better so that you can represent him well. So basically, Paul, and then he went on, and I, and I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened, that you would have a deep revelation in your hearts of the, our, our hope in Christ, our inheritance in Christ, and our power in Christ. Basic, you know, the, basically, the power that raised Jesus from the dead. So basically, Paul was praying and saying, I pray in that you would have an intimate, a more intimate relationship with God, and you would also have a greater revelation of your position in Christ. And he kept praying that. He understood how important our position in Christ and having that revelation is. And then he goes on and says, and, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? Ephesians chapter 1, 19. So we have this great power, but we have to, we must believe that we have been given this great power. And only then will we start to see that power flowing through us. 
See, it's, it's, it's like <laughs> so often I'll try to do some work at, at home, right? And I'll start using my hands and play. I went, oh, I forgot I have a tool for doing that. <laughs> I had the tool, but instead I'm trying to force it. And, and they go, oh, I have that tool, so I just go and get the tool. Well, you know, and so often we try to, in the flesh, do the things of God, and we try to work in the flesh, and we go, oh, I've got a tool. It's called our, my position in Christ. And in that, in that thing called position in Christ, I have power and authority. So we have to believe, though. You know, so release, uh, um, exercising and releasing the power and authority of God requires confident belief on our part. We have to believe that we have authority and power in Christ and then, and that we can and that we should use it and that we will see great results when we do. Expectation again. Faith is expectation. Faith is not just belief, it's expectation. Okay, second thing we need, after saying all that about confidence and belief, we also need some humility. You know, actually I'll go back here so we're not reading that for a sec. You know, uh, pride should never be part of exercising our authority, okay? Pride should never be part of exercising our authority. In fact, if we study, if you study the topic of pride in First Peter and also in James, you'll discover that pride is always connected with spiritual warfare. Always. Pride is always connected with spiritual warfare because pride will drag you into spiritual warfare and hinder your ability to overcome the devil. Look what it says here, James chapter 4, verse 6, 7. He gives us more grace. That is why the scripture says God opposes the proud. As soon as you allow pride to come up in your life, you come into opposition to God. Do you understand that? Your great, the, God's greatest enemy is not the devil. God's greatest enemy is your pride. Because you come into stark opposition to God when you allow pride. And I'm not, you know, I'm... I'm, I'm when you, David, when you allow pride in your life, you're coming into opposition with God. And that's why God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. His grace, his supernatural ability to overcome, it, it, it goes to the humble. And therefore, and then if you do deal with pride and you uh, receive his grace, then you can submit yourself to God easily and you'll be able to resist the devil easily and he's going to flee from you. He's going to be like that minister that walked through the door. Because you know he ha you have power and authority, and so does the devil. Jesus is telling us, or James is telling us, that we humble ourselves, God gives us more grace, and then we can submit to the devil, or I'm sorry, we can submit to God, sorry, we can submit to God properly and be able to resist the devil. So really, what is humility? If we need to understand, see, see, here's a new way to look at humility maybe. Pride is placing our confidence in the wrong source, in ourselves. Humility is placing our confidence in the right source, and our source is Christ. That's what true humility is. Always put my confidence in Jesus, not in myself. So we humbly take our position in Christ, then we're gonna be able to use our spiritual power and authority over the devil. Number three of four, number, uh, number three, there it is. Boldness through the Holy Spirit. Proverbs 28, verse 1. The wicked man, he flees, though no one pursues. Wow. But the righteous are as bold as a lion. And who are the righteous? Well, those who know their position in Christ. Those who have understand the revelation that they are righteous in Christ. And so when the Satan says, Satan goes, God can't use you. You had a two-sin day yesterday. And, and, and you can respond and say, I know I had two sin day yesterday, but I'm righteous in Christ. So God can use me in my imperfection. So get out of the way, Satan. Right? We trust in the righteousness of Christ that he's freely given to us. We will never be bold against the devil if we believe that we're unrighteous or unworthy or unable to use our authority. And then we read in Acts chapter 4, verse 31, after they prayed, the place they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. So, if, if you, you know, part three, if we're going to use our authority, we have to be bold. And the best way to become bold is after recognizing we are righteous in Christ, is to 
Keep getting filled with the Holy Spirit. I can promise you, when you get a fresh touch of God, you're, you're just on fire again, right? You're just bold again. You're energized again. So we keep getting refilled with the Holy Spirit, and then we can boldly take our position in Christ and stand firm and rest in our place in Christ and allow ourselves to be instruments in God's hand. And, and then the fourth thing, we have to be confident in God's will that he does want to use us. God does want to use each, I'm going to put that back again because you're reading it. God wants to use each one of us, but do we believe it? Do you really believe that if you've been a Christian one day, God wants to use you? Do you believe if you're a Christian for only three months, God wants to use you, or three years, or three decades, or whatever? God wants to use each person. God wants to use children. God wants to use teenagers. God wants to use us all. We have to be confident that this is part of God's purpose for our lives. And as we're going to read this, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, 11, God's intent was that now through the church, that's you and I, right? Church is not an institution. The church is the body of believers. Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. So what's that saying? The manifold wisdom of God is God's plan is to be made known to the heavenly, to the demonic powers through us. And that is made known at the wisdom of God is God using frail human vessels like you and I to overcome demonic principalities and powers. That's God's wisdom. We think we need to keep pulling in like... Um, I don't know, Reinhard Bonnke, or maybe, let's get An Andrew Womack in, and a couple of those other big hitters, and they're going to come and do all this stuff. And God said, no, the wisdom of God is to use the simple, is to use the weak, to, to use the children, to use you and I to overcome demonic powers. That's the wisdom of God. And that messes up the demonic realms, because they're, they're looking for a fight with Paul, right? And you go, my name is not Paul. My name is just Michael, or Kevin, or Sandy, or... Or, or Chris or whatever. And, and he's, not, he's not looking for us to overcome him, so he's kind of unaware. He, he's kind of caught off guard when one of us just comes in and say, in Jesus' name, I take authority over a demonic spirit, and I command it to leave now in Jesus' name. And Satan's going, who did that? Who did that? What, Chris did that? But, but do you know who Chris is? Do you know all the things he used to do? Do you know the, his failures in life? And God says, yeah, I'm pretty smart, aren't I? I decided to use Chris because you weren't ready for Chris. Isn't that awesome? I'm excited anyway. So part of our purpose is to demonstrate God's manifold wisdom to demonic powers in the heavenly realm by exercising our authority in Christ. And yet today, sadly, have to believe the, the church doesn't believe in the demonic realm, and many of those who do don't realize they have authority over the demonic realm. Hopefully we do. Hopefully now, if not before, hopefully today, you realize. We must know who we are in Christ. We must know the authority that we have in Christ to do God's will. Then we can humbly but boldly exercise the authority in Christ. And then we simply but firmly command. Say, remember, there's no, no increased authority when you yell, right? We just firmly, boldly exercise the authority in Christ. Command Satan or the demon or the spirit to go because we are not going anywhere. So he's going to have to. It's like last one in the room wins. So if there's you and a demon in the room, tell the demon to go because you're not moving. So what do we do? Well, we can thank God again that he's given us power and authority. If we hadn't, didn't get it last week, hopefully we got it this week. And then we can, whenever we face spiritual warfare, we can choose to use our authority and power to overcome the activity of devil. Remember, not over people, but if the people are being used by Satan, and then we're, let's actually let's do a quick activation there. Um, okay, so first, Lord, we just thank you. We thank you that in your wisdom, you have given us, your children, power and authority. In your wisdom, you have allowed us to be carriers and demonstrators of resurrection power and ascension power. Thank you, you've given that to us. What can we say but thank you, Jesus? What can we say but thank you, Jesus? You are so wise. We would not have done it that way, but you did it that way. 
for a plan, for a purpose, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God would make, be made known into the heavenly realms, the demonic realms. And Lord, I pray that you would help us each this week to use our authority and power. We, I pray, Lord God, you would just give us that boldness this week. Keep us humble, yeah, but give us that boldness to use our authority and power. And how, how do we do this? Let me quick activation. How do you do this? Okay, someone is trying to take you to court. What do you do? Well, you can't tell the guy not to take you to court. You have no authority. But if that guy is being stirred up by some sort of demonic spirit or uh, aggressive spirit, you can say, in Jesus' name, I take authority over that spirit that is causing that man to take me to court. And I tell that spirit that it is stopped. It, the, the assignment against me is canceled. That spirit must go in Jesus' name. Okay? Or if a, a, a person, a person, a family member is causing all sorts of trouble, you can't take authority over that family member, but you can say in the name of Jesus, I come against that spirit that's causing my family member to be disobedient or aggressive or rebellious or whatever, and I command that spirit to leave my family member alone. I cancel its assignment over their lives in Jesus' name, and I, I, de I declare that they are free to be who they are apart from that spirit because that spirit has no more authority or power over my, my family member. You can do that. Uh, what's another quick example? Um, I'm just trying to come up with three. Something about three. I like three. <laughs> okay. Um, say your neighbor is causing you all sorts of grief or whatever, right? They're noisy. They're, uh, they're, they're, they're doing things. They're, they're, they're whatever, throwing stuff on your lawn or whatever. Well, again, that's some sort of tormenting spirit at work there. Well, you have no authority over your neighbor. You can go to your neighbor in Jesus' name, stop it, right? Because then you, you get maybe that. Although, now, again, if I once had a guy try to, punch, uh, again, I once tried to have a guy punch me, and I just finished learning that sometimes when people are uh, 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 really aggressive and it's very irrational, it's sometimes a spirit. So he, he got like this. He was about... Uh, was he 15 years old, I think, and he just suddenly got really aggressive, and he went like this, and I just said, in Jesus' name, stop. And he went, <laughs> and he was watching his hand. Stop it, stop it, what are you doing to me? I said, I just said the name of Jesus. He said, stop it, get away from me, and then he ran out the door, okay, because there was a spirit using him. Now, if it wasn't a spirit, I was in bad trouble, right? I would have had probably a bloody nose, but it was a spirit. Thankfully, it was a spirit. Yeah. So, yeah. So, the point is, if, if, if there's a neighbor that's being aggressive against you and it's caused by a spirit, you can take authority over that spirit, whether it's a, a rebellious spirit or tormenting spirit or whatever. You can say, in the name of Jesus, I command that spirit to stop using my neighbor to torment me. I cancel that assignment. I command them to stop coming against me in Jesus' name. Okay, you can do that. Yeah, and you can certainly take authority over yourself. Yeah. Especially if you have spirit stuff going on. You can, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over the tormenting spirit that's giving me bad dreams or that's giving me fear or that's agitating me or causing me to be anxious. And in Jesus' name, I command that spirit to leave me in Jesus' name. I cancel its assignment over my own life and I close that door, whatever it is God show me with that door is that it is canceled, that it is closed so that the spirit will not come back. And I tell, tell it to leave now in Jesus' name. And I pray the blood of Jesus Christ over to me to cleanse me and, and, and uh, purify me that I am free from that spirit. Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. See, that's how you use your authority and power in Christ. Okay. In Jesus' name, Lord, thank you for authority and power. Thank you for what you have given us, and thank you that we now can administrate your power and authority over every work of the enemy in this world. Satan, you're no longer the prince of us. Jesus is the prince of us. We declare it in Jesus' name, and God's people said, Amen. Amen. I just have to push a button here. Give me one second. Yeah. Yeah, there's a nice flow today because God really wants us to get this, right? It's not, it's not like, oh, Dave, Pastor Dave had a great mess today. No, God really wanted us to get this today, and I just got to be the, the, the donkey that he was speaking <laughs> through, right? The, the donkey of Balaam, right? Well, the ba Balaam. <laughs> I just think of Balaam the donkey. If God can use Balaam's donkey, God can use me, right? Okay, yeah, so bless you guys.